We're starting a new series of sermons uh, right now for Christmas time, uh, and it's called kind of a journalistic look at Christmas. It's searching for a Savior. We have... Uh, on the side walls, we have some great big word searches that have the words, the key words from the various sermons that are coming up. And hopefully you'll be looking at those, not just the entire time and having fun with that, but uh, using it to help you remember a little bit more of the sermon. In a final examination in an introductory biology course at a university, there were some freshman classes that were absolutely huge. There was one that had over 500 students in that class. The examination, the final exam, was a very long exam. It was two hours long. The exam bu booklets had been provided and people were working on it. The professor was very strict and told the class that no exam that wasn't on his desk within two hours would be accepted and that student would have an automatic fail. Half an hour into the exam, a student came rushing in and saying, hey, can I take that exam? And the professor said, you don't have enough time to finish this exam. And he said, but let me go ahead and try. And so the, the professor let him have an exam book, and he took it, and he started working on it. And he started working on it. At two hours, the professor called for everybody to turn their exams in. Students filed up. They handed them in, all except for the student who had come in late. He continued writing. About half an hour later, that student closed the exam book and took his, his test up there and got ready to give it to the professor. And the professor says, no, you don't. I will not accept it. It's late. I told you that when you first came in. The student looked incredulous. He was very angry with it. He said, do you know who I am? The professor said, and as a matter of fact, I don't. Do you know who I am? Professor says, I don't know who you are, and I don't care. It doesn't make a difference. The student immediately grabbed some of the stack, lifted it up, stuck his exam in, and put it down, and left. <laughs> you know, that could work, couldn't it? <laughs> you know, I challenge the leaders of Valley Christian Church here to get to know everyone who comes to Valley Christian Church. Try to call them by name. I think it's important to be able to know who people are, to call them by name. But we don't always remember. Sometimes we forget. Thankfully, we have these little name cards uh, to help some of us. In today's world, the media downplays the real reason for Christmas, the who of Christmas. For some people, the only who they know about Christmas is from the Grinch story. Remember the who's down below? <laughs> if you watch all the TV specials, you would believe that Christmas is not about Jesus and a Savior, but rather it's about a, a real heavy, obese man wearing a red suit with black boots, or you might think it's a snowman, or you might think it's some Yeti or, or some short men dressed in green you would not get the impression it was about Jesus Christ. Today as we start this short series of searching for a Savior, looking at this journalistic look of Christmas, I want to be starting with the who. Later on we're going to have the what, the where, the when, the why. Today I want to focus in on the who. Let's start in Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 16, but let's start first with prayer. Lord, I do thank you for your love. I thank you for the blessings you have given to us. I thank you for Christmas. And Lord, even though it's so commercialized and some people get sick and tired of it, help us, Lord, to remember this is the time we remember Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah, the one who came for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read this passage as best I can. I apologize right away if I mispronounce names or pronounce them different than the way you've heard them read. Uh, but I'm going to start Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron, and Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amminadab. Amminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. And Obed fathered Jesse. Jesse fathered David the king. David fathered Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Rehoboam followed Abijah. And Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat fathered Joram. Joram fathered Uzziah. Uzziah fathered Jotham. Jotham fathered Ahaz. Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. Hezekiah fathered Manasseh. Manasseh fathered Ammon. Ammon fathered Josiah. Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. 
After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Shealtiel, and Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel fathered Abahud. Abahud fathered Eliakim, and Eliakim fathered Azor. Azor fathered Zadok, and Zadok fathered Achim, and Achim fathered Eliad, and Eliad fathered Eliezer, and Eliezer fathered Mathan, and Mathan fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called Messiah. There's a lot of names there. And some of you are sitting there like, oh, I don't get this. Why are we going over all these names? Well, I want to look at a simple outline from this. It basically comes from verse 1 there. Where Matthew lets us know, first of all, that Jesus was the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham. And if you've been looking at these uh, word searches on the side wall, you will notice that Abraham is right over here, uh, somewhere over here. There we go. You found it there. A B R A H A M. Abraham there. Second row over, going straight down. Abraham. Uh, Matthew's genealogical record starts with Abraham down to Jesse, the father of David. And when you go back through this genealogical record, starting in the book of Genesis, we can read of God's promises to the forefathers. God made a promise to Abraham that from his seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And how Abraham would become the father of many nations. And how his descendants would be as numerous as the sands of the seashore. These promises seemed unlikely since they were first made to Abraham, or by the name of Abram at the time, when he was 75 years old, and his wife was 65 years old, and so far, even though they'd been married a long time, they had not been able to have any children. Now Sarai was way past the childbearing age, and yet God made these promises to Abraham. He made promises uh, to Isaac. He made promises to Jacob. He made promises to the descendants. And sometimes these promises were made long before the births. And God kept making promises that this would be the chosen race through whom the Messiah, the Son of God, the Messiah would come. And I can't help but look at these people in this genealogical record, these forefathers. And I have to ask this question. Do you think they were perfect or imperfect people? Imperfect would be a good way to decide that. And the reason I have to ask this question is because of all the times that I have heard people tell me, God can't use me because I'm not perfect. You ever try to use that? You ever try to use the fact that you've got things in your past that you've done that, well, God wouldn't want to use you. God wouldn't want you at church. Look at i got all these things imperfect. And yet look at these people that God used looking that Jesus was going to be the son of Abraham and make these promises to the forefathers. Were they perfect? Well, let's consider Abraham. Abraham was told to leave his family and travel to a land that God would show him. Did he leave his family and travel? He took his dad along. He wasn't going to leave everybody. He took his dad along. And he went on there. And after the death of his father, he was told to go settle in a land that God gave him. But when a drought and a famine came, Abraham left that land that God gave him and went down to Egypt. While he was in Egypt, Pharaoh looked at his wife Sarai, 65 years of age and older, and looked at her and said, wow, she is a good-looking woman. And says, I want to take her for a wife. Abraham is scared to death that he, he's going to have Abraham killed. So he tells Sarah, make sure you tell him, I'm your brother. You're my sister. He's lying. Oh, Abraham is, had his good points, but he also had some bad points. Remember when God tells Abraham and tells Sarah, you're going to have a son? Remember what both of them did? Most of the time we just remember what she did. She laughed, but guess what Abraham also did? He laughed. He didn't really believe it, didn't think it was possible. He had his good points. He was willing to obey God, even if it meant offering up his own son Isaac in a sacrifice to God. But God stopped that at the very last second. But Abraham was like us. He was imperfect. Yet God used him for bringing out the plan of bringing in a Savior. When Isaac, uh, his son, looked for food among the Philistines, guess what Isaac did that was very much like his dad, Abraham? He lied. Make sure you tell people, you're my sister. And he did the same thing that, that his father had done before Pharaoh. Claimed his wife was not his wife, but his sister. 
Isaac's sons grew up. Remember, Isaac played favorites. He favored one son over the other. He fueled a jealousy between the two brothers. He drove a wedge between those two brothers. Isaac wasn't perfect. Next in the genealogical record is Jacob of these forefathers. Jacob is the one who, when his brother had been out hunting all day and came back in and he was starving, remember what Jacob did? You can't have any soup unless you do what? Sell me your birthright. He was shrewd. He was devious. Later on, when his dad had gone blind and his dad wanted to give a blessing to his brother, while his brother was out hunting, trying to get some wild animal, he slaughtered a goat and he, he made it, prepared it, and he put um, hair on his arms because his brother was hairy and he wasn't. And he went in there and he deceived his dad to get the blessing that his dad had intended for his brother. And his actions of deceit pushed him to live in exile for at least 14 years. Was he a perfect person? No. He was imperfect. Next, we read about Judah of the forefathers. Judah and his brothers, what did they do to their younger brother, Joseph? Sold him into slavery. And then they deceived their father into thinking that a wild animal had killed Joseph. He's not exactly a perfect, outstanding individual either. Yet Matthew points out one other not-so-stellar thing Judah did. He fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. That doesn't seem so bad unless you read the whole story in the book of Genesis. Remember how Judah was out doing some things and, and he decided to go into a prostitute to have sex while he was shearing his sheep. So he went into it, didn't realize it was his daughter-in-law. And he had sex with his daughter-in-law. And then when he found out she got pregnant, he was ready to have her stoned to death because she wasn't faithful to her vows. He only stopped when he found out he was the one who had impregnated his daughter-in-law. Were these men perfect? Definitely not. They were not perfect people. God didn't use the forefathers. He didn't use Abraham and all these people because they were perfect and spotless and totally God-fearing all the time. They were messed up people like you and I. Some of the people have great things said about them, but there's also some things that people said about them that would definitely not make good news. It would make news in today's world, but it wouldn't make good news. God used imperfect people to bring about the who of Christmas. The second point from this passage that is brought up in verse 1 is that Jesus is the son of David. Jesus came from the lineage of David. I think Matthew separated this part of the genealogy because David was a king. The king. And God is showing us through Matthew that God promised kings that the Messiah was going to come in through this line. This makes a lot more sense to me about who the who of Christmas should be. That he should come from royalty, from the kings of the Jewish nation. And, and so when we look at the who of, of Christmas being Jesus Christ, the Savior who came from royal line, man, that makes sense from our human side. Why shouldn't the king of all kings and lord of all lords come from a royal lineage? And so we expect the one who would be born, who would change the world, so much so that we even change our calendars and we date our calendars by his birth, A.D., Anno Dominum, that he should be born of a line of kings. And God made promises to kings like King David. And God told David that someone from his lineage was going to sit upon the throne for eternity. His days would never end. This is the who of Christmas. Yet David and these other kings that are listed for us in verses 6 through 11, were they perfect or imperfect people? Imperfect. Matthew makes certain that we know that they were not perfect people. When he speaks about David in this line, it says, He fathered Solomon by the one who had been the wife of Uriah. He's bringing us back to the Old Testament to remember that affair that King David had when he looked down at his neighbor's house, saw his, his neighbor Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, bathing, and he called her up. He had his people go down and get her and bring her up into his bedroom, and they had sex, and they had this affair. And when she becomes pregnant, remember the soap opera? I mean, he brings back Uriah from the battlefield and tries to get him to go into his wife, and instead he sleeps outside. So then he gets her, him really drunk at a party trying to get him to go in there, and it doesn't happen. And eventually he gives up trying to hide the affair 
because Uriah refused to go into his wife when his men are still on the battlefield. And David has it written, put Uriah at the very front of the battle and get him killed. Draw back and let him get all the enemy against him. So was David perfect or imperfect? He's imperfect. And even though he did all these evil things, he still, the scripture says, he had a heart like unto God. And God looked at him, and even though he was imperfect, like every one of us, God used him to bring in the Savior. His son Solomon, while we read about him, he's the one with great wisdom. Sometimes, though he didn't think with his brain, he thought with his lust. He married hundreds of wives and many concubines. And Solomon had his glorious days, but he also had his days, which are days we would prefer to forget because he wasn't perfect either. His son Rehoboam, even growing up with the wisest of all men uh, as, as his dad, Rehoboam shows foolishness. When his dad dies and Rehoboam is set up on the king, the advisors of Solomon came in and said, you know what, there was problems in the country. Why don't you lessen the taxes and, and, and treat the people nice and, and so that they'll like you and things will work out good. But Rehoboam's advisors of his own age told him what? Throw the taxes on heavier. Give them harder burden, burdens. And he split the kingdom apart. And ten tribes went with Jeroboam, and then Rehoboam was left with just two of the twelve tribes of Israel. He wasn't perfect. You can read through this list of the kings of Judah. Some of these guys were pretty good guys. Some of them were rotten to the core. But even the good guys had their bad days. There's not a one of these men who is listed for us who was absolutely perfect. They were all imperfect. They were just like you and I. Yet God used them to bring about his will, the who of Christmas. Jesus, the son of Abraham. Jesus, the son of David. And third, we look at that Matthew points out that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And if you're looking for Messiah, that's right there at the top. I don't know if I ever showed David, but David was down here. Messiah is right at the top there. The Messiah. We've looked at the lineage of the forefathers from Abraham on down. We looked at the kings with David and, and down. And down to Jeconiah and the deportation to Babylon. We have this genealogical list of people. And then it starts bringing up a whole bunch of people. And God made promises to people. Were those other people, the kings and the forefathers people? Yes. But now I'm bringing up about these people because these people are more common. What do we know about these people? Well, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, is mentioned in Ezra, he's mentioned in Nehemiah, he's mentioned in Obadiah, as coming out of the exile, uh, out of Babylon, and going down to help with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple, and being part of the revival that took place in Jerusalem. But these other men in this list, we have very little information about them. Some of them have names that were in common with other people in the Bible, but at a different time period. So we don't know much about these men in this genealogical record. Except for the fact they're in this lineage, and God used them to the bringing about of the who of Christmas. Were these perfect or imperfect people? How common were these people? You know, I look at this and I keep thinking about it over and over. You know, if they were exceptionally great men of God who did mighty miracles and lived perfect lives, I think God would have given that point out to us, especially if it was important for us to know. Instead, basically, we know names in a genealogical record. I tend to think that they were people just like you and just like me. They were people God used to bring about the Messiah, the Savior, the who of Christmas, but they were ordinary people who brought about the greatest event of mankind, the sending of the Savior for all people. It seems so easy from the standpoint of those who believe this message about the who in Christmas, that Jesus the Messiah came from this, yet not everyone can find the who of Christmas. Why can't they find the who of Christmas? Well, you remember when the wise men came searching from the east for the Savior, the king of the Jews? They first went to Jerusalem to the palace, to the home of King Herod, king of the Jews, figuring that if they were looking for an earthly king of the Jews, that the most logical place would be to the home of a king where he would be born as the next king. But they were wrong 
about where they could find the who of Christmas. Because the who of Christmas isn't just one location, it's just not one king. When King Herod sent his troops to Bethlehem to kill the king of the Jews, the soldiers were looking for any male child two years of age and under. But they didn't find the Messiah. They didn't find the king of the Jews, for his parents had taken him and fled down to Egypt to protect him. The who of Christmas wasn't just any baby. When the wise men came to the manger searching the, for the good news of the great joy which is for all the people, for the Savior, for the Messiah who was born, they found the correct who. Just as the angels had promised to the shepherds that he was there lying in a manger. They found the right who because they listened to the true word of God given to them by the angels. Who are we looking for at Christmas? Are we still looking for that obese man dressed in red with black boots? Are we still looking for, uh, you know, something in the store, something on some, uh, some corner, maybe in a parade? Are we looking for some toy that's going to be the real who of Christmas? Are we looking for a savior in the government? I mean, there's some people, that's what they're looking for. Well, if we elect the right person, that's going to be our savior. But that's not the real who of Christmas. Are you looking for a savior in various religious books, and various religious teachers, and various religious people, various religious churches? Does it really matter which Savior, which Messiah you believe in just as long as you feel good about it? I'll tell you this much, it matters. Let's suppose you receive a phone call from an own unknown number. You know, most of us have caller ID on our phones and you get one that says it's an unknown number or it says potential spam. And the person says, I'm from your credit card company, and we have some suspicious charges on your credit card. We need to investigate the possible fraud. And so they start asking you questions. What is your name? Do you give them your full name? What is your social security number? What is your date of birth? What is your credit card number? What is your mother's maiden name? Are you going to tell them all that information? Does it matter if you sincerely believe they are from your credit card company? Oh, it matters, but yet don't give that information out. Let's suppose they call you up on your phone and they say, guess what, you have won the lottery. All we need is your full name, your address, your bank routing number, and your bank account number so we can send you the, the money. Do you give them that information? Does it matter as long as you believe they're going to give you money? In today's world of fraud, we know better than ever. You need to keep your brains in gear and search for the correct who in Christmas. Don't go searching in the wrong places. Don't go searching among deceivers. Look to the word of God and know the true Savior then share that news with others. God can use you. You don't have to be perfect and spotless and sinless to be used by God. You don't have to be super special to be used by God. You don't have to be a super Christian. God brought in the who of Christmas, Jesus Christ the Messiah, through imperfect forefathers, imperfect kings, and imperfect common people just like you and me. Let God use you this Christmas season to take the message of the Savior to others who are still searching for a Savior. Lord, I ask that you help us. You help us to truly look in the right places, to know that there are frauds out there. There are false things out there. Help us, Lord, to look for the truth. Help us to realize that the one who was born and laid in a manger was the true Messiah. Lord, I'm so thankful that you used imperfect people in that lineage to show me that even though I'm imperfect, I can be used to share the message of the Messiah, the Savior, the who of Christmas, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with other people. Let us truly share that message in Jesus' name. 
Amen.